I am one of those strange people who considers myself a personal finance buff and a hospice doctor. Basically, when I was seven years old, my father was 40. He died suddenly. He was an oncologist or cancer doctor. I decided I wanted to be just like him and become a doctor. I had no interest in money. I didn't think about money at all. My passion was to practice medicine. I eventually went to medical school, became a doctor, got incredibly burned out, and started looking for a way out. I was lucky I had parents who modeled great financial information for me, so I invested lots of money. I saved. I owned real estate, but I didn't really understand it until I read a book by Jim Dolly, The White Coat Investor, that pretty much gave me the vocabulary to understand my finances. I realized I was financially independent, but I had no idea what to do with my life. I certainly didn't know how to step away from this identity of being a physician. So I started writing about personal finance. I started a podcast and started to try to figure out not how you get to financial independence, because I felt like we were kind of clear on how to get there, but more what you do once you're there with it. Strangely enough, the one part of medicine I still loved was doing hospice or dealing with the terminally ill, and I found that they were providing answers to all those financial questions I had. What's purposeful in life? What does money do for us? What should we be striving for? So I entered this interesting liminal space of being a personal finance expert, as well as a hospice doctor, and realizing that the two parts of my life were colliding and they actually made sense together, which surprises and I know, most people. You know, you've talked about before, I think there's a certain phrase for it around things where people kind of look back at their lives and think about the things they did or didn't accomplish. Uh, and, and when you're talking about a hospice um, patient, could you talk about that a little bit? So we do something in hospice called the life review process. So once a patient is admitted to hospice, what that means is they have six months or less to live and medical treatments aren't going to help them or prolong their life in this case. And we often do a lot of work to get them physically comfortable and make sure they're in the right place and they have all the support they need. But part of dealing with dying is emotionally coming to terms with your life and thinking about what you accomplished and what you didn't accomplish. So the doctor, the nurse, the social worker, the chaplain, someone at, at some point sits down with the patient and they do something called a life review. And that's where we really go through a series of questions with our patients to talk to them about what was important in their life. What did they accomplish? What didn't they accomplish? What were those key relationships? What did they fail at? What do they hope to accomplish in whatever bit of life they have left? And those questions, that framing I found is so helpful, not just for the dying, but maybe we should start using that framing for the much younger living who are struggling with this idea of what is my sense of purpose and identity and what should I be doing with this wonderful of tool of money that we work so hard to accumulate in the financial. So I feel like community. Justin and I often say things like, you know, people value experiences. You should keep your fixed expenses as low as possible, the housing, the transportation, but you have like real empirical data. So I'm curious, Doc. Are there people that are on their deathbed that are like, you know what? I really wish I just spent more money in that house or I really wish I bought that Ferrari instead of that, you know, Nissan. Are there people who do that? You know, Justin and I, again, are just saying these stats kind of willy nilly without data to support it. But I'm curious if there is a subset of the population that does really truly value those things more than experiences, family connection. Mostly not. Right. So, uh, Obviously, most people don't say, I wish I made more money. They say, I don't wish, I wish I didn't work more nights and weekends. No, no one says that, right? I wish I did. Um, when it comes to things, the only time people really wish they spent more money on things is when those things signified something else of importance. So I wish I had bought that Ferrari actually often translates into, I had this love of racing. And when I was a young man, I thought I'd be good at it, but I never went after it. And so sometimes when people stick with these ideas of things, it's usually that it signifies something else that was purposeful in their life that they regret not going. I think you're in an interesting position because obviously you're a doctor most of your life and that's what you, you know, that's what you resonated with, what you identified as. And now you're a writer and, and, you know, creating financial content. And that's kind of what you identify as, Um, you know, as you look back on life and you think about that, like, do you think you'd be in the position now to understand that, this is maybe what you really wanted to do if it weren't for the fact that you were already financially independent, like without that financial stability, do you think you honestly would have had the space to figure out what you truly wanted to be? I have no doubt that I could have and should have, but didn't. Um, 
I wore this identity of being a physician over myself like a cloak because that's what my dad did and because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. But even in my early career, I found myself sneaking away to write or sneaking away to do a blog post or doing things that now I find more purposeful. In fact, part of my identity, the part of the identity I still like about being a physician is hospice work. I started volunteering in hospice my first week of medical school. A hospice patient was the first patient I ever saw. There is no reason I couldn't have used that as a reason to pursue hospice medicine from the beginning. But instead, I convinced myself I could never make enough money doing that. I considered that there were other things I should be doing. I didn't really listen to my inner voice at that time. So I went after other parts of medicine and eventually became burned out. I think there were many opportunities there. It's just no one had ever taught me to start thinking about purpose and identity, I either thought I already had that as being a physician and wouldn't listen to any other thoughts that that may not fit. Or eventually I started thinking about money as my sense of purpose and didn't want to do the harder work of thinking more of it as a tool towards something else. So I definitely could have done that work. Um, I just don't think I was awake to the possibility like most of us I don't think we're thoughtful enough about this idea that money is a tool among many other tools to actually help us live purposeful lives, but we don't necessarily have to put off that purposeful life for years and years and years and years until you have enough money. We have to start thinking about doing that sooner. It's really exciting actually to see that the financial independence movement has evolved to people who are actually taking this into account. And I think both of you are perfect examples of it. You've both kind of said, look, I'm not going to be miserable for 10 or 15 or 20 years to one day get to financial independence so I can figure out what I want in life. Younger people are starting to look at their lives now and saying, well, how can I live today as well as tomorrow and yet still be fiscally responsible? And I think it's the much more mature way to look at this issue of managing both our finances as well. Now, where as our do you sense fall on the follow your passion versus follow what pays scale? I'm sure it's changed for you over the years, but... I find this debate pretty interesting on every social media platform, Instagram, Twitter, there's heated debates on, you know, even if you love being a snowboard instructor, you should just work in tech and work in tech for seven years so you can retire, even though you want to be a snowboard instructor so bad, but you might only make 15 grand. So where do you follow, Doc, on the follow your passion versus follow the money scale? So I think there are a few different ways to financial independence. I talk about in the book three the last one of the path of what I call the youngest brother is the passion play. This is the idea that if you love what you do, if it fulfills your sense of purpose, identity, and connections, which is the whole purpose of money is to be able to do that, and you happen to find a job that gives you that sense from day one, and that job provides enough money to pay for your monthly needs, in a sense, you're financially independent from day one. That's lovely, but it's not common. And it's not common for a few reasons. One is often people find that they can't make a living doing their passion. They love painting, but they're not a good enough painter to sell enough paintings to actually make a living at it. So that's one problem. The other problem, and there's a fun story that goes along with this, is sometimes when we take something we're highly internally motivated to do, something we're passionate about, and we place external rewards on that like money, it actually quenches our interest in doing that thing we think we're passionate about. Let me give you a perfect example of this. Pretend like we live on a long street and at the end of the street, there's this old guy and his joy in life is his lawn. And so he spends all his time fixing his lawn, cutting the lawn, getting the flowers right. And the minute he turns to go into his house, the local kids on the block love to play football and they extend their football game onto his lawn and trample, trample, trample. They ruin his grass. Now, the old guy tries and tries. He yells at the kids. He begs them. He pleads. But every time he goes back in the house, they're at it again. So he kind of understands this idea about internal and external motivation. It's behavioral theory. So he gets smart. He goes up to the kids and he says, you know what? I think you playing on the grass is actually good for it. It fertilizes it. I'm going to give you $10 every week. Go ahead, play on the lawn. Now, the kids are overjoyed. They're like, not only do we get to play football like we totally wanted to do, we were internally motivated to do, but we also have money to go out and buy candy. So the kids played football and their hearts were full and their pockets were full of money and candy. Then the guy, the old guy turns the screws. He comes back a week later and he says, you haven't been doing as good of a job as I thought you would. The, the lawn doesn't look so great. I'm going to give you $5 this week. 
We'll see how you do, and then we'll redecide next week. Now, the kids are a little pissed off, right? They were getting 10, now they're only getting five, but they still get to play football. And so they go and they play, and their hearts are full, but maybe a little bit less. They have a little bit less candy in their pocket. Finally, the last week, the old guy walks over to him and says, you know what, you've been doing a horrible job. You're not doing anything for me. Play football as much as you want, but I'm not giving you another cent. The kids huff and puff. They look the old man in the eye and they say, we are never going to play football on your lawn again. They turn around, walk away, and they never return. Sometimes when we take something we're internally motivated to do a passion and we receive external rewards like money, it actually kills our passion in doing these things. So a lot of people who think they're taking the passion play and they start doing something they're passionate about end up hating their jobs or hating their bosses or hating their colleagues. And therefore, it doesn't work out. So instead, I think it's great to build passion into your life. I think it's great to be able to find a job you're passionate about. If you can't, then you have to be real intentional about using that tool of money that you make from your job in order to pursue that passion at other times. Maybe it's on nights and weekends. Maybe you start take that passion, start a side hustle on the weekend because you're young and you've got tons of energy. And if that passion starts making money, you can pull away a little bit from that nine to five you don't like and spend more time doing your passion. Maybe that passion starts covering half of your income and you go half time at that job you don't like. So I don't think we have to completely discount passion, but not everyone is gonna be able to be passionate about everything they do. So there is a purpose to making money. It's okay to do things you don't like doing. The key is to be intentional and to always have your eye on this idea of subtracting out the things in your life you don't like doing and filling in that space with things you do like doing. And if you can kind of use that goal from the start, you're going to be a lot more intentional about how you live your love life that analogy. and how I love, you save like money. Kind of your just rational look at that and not just going with the pure the pure passion by understanding that at the end of the day there there is you know a financial component and financial components can kind of poison you know those things that you do feel like you enjoy your passion projects. I mean, I think about you know, pizzas. I've gotten to where I love making pizzas. It's crossed my mind. Like, would everyone have a pizza food truck? But, you know, if I'm being realistic, I love making pizzas. I know I'm not making money. There's no stress to make money off of them. As soon as all of a sudden now it becomes a for-profit business, there's an expectation that I'm placing on myself. And if I screw up something or if I don't make money, now all of a sudden it's a failure when I'm doing the exact same thing I, I was just doing before. It's just now, instead of being excited that I'm getting to share something with friends and, and see their reaction, now I'm just angry at myself because I've miscalculated a formula and I, now I'm not making money. So um, <laughs> I, I do love that take. And so for, but also just, I love all your kind of psychological takes. Like you're, you're thinking through the thought process for someone who is kind of struggling with that and trying to figure out what their identity is. I mean, you know, you've talked a little bit about retroactively, like now you saw the signs is there an exercise or something that you would recommend people do to, to try to pause and be introspective and think about maybe what they actually should be identifying as versus what they have just kind of found themselves in? So interestingly enough, I usually ask people to do something that's very uncomfortable, which is take their financial concerns and put them on the side for a moment. Because I think the mistake we make, the mistake I made is we decide money comes first and then everything else comes later. Obviously, we're not going to solve all of our financial problems at once. So if we curb those for a moment and start thinking about purpose, identity, and connections, we then can eventually go back and attack our financial problems with some real intention. So the, the question becomes then, how do we start identifying our purpose, identity, and connections so that we can then build them into our financial plan? The book has lots of exercises to do this, but I would suggest there are two main ones that you should really think about. One has to do with purpose and the other has to do with identity. What we do with our hospice patients is a full life review. We're not going to go through that right now, but a visualization exercise that can help a young person is imagine that you're on your deathbed bemoaning your life and you're thinking to yourself, I regret that I never had the energy, courage, or time to, and then fill in the blank. Like, what would you really regret that you haven't done yet because you finally found out all of a sudden you were dying? It's a great visualization for you to start thinking about what is germane to your sense of purpose. And I think it's a, a good way of at least starting to think of purpose. There's lots of other ways to do it. 
sometimes I just ask people, well, what was the last thing that woke you up in the middle of the night and you got so excited you couldn't fall back asleep? Like, did you pursue that thing? Like that thing probably has part of your purpose in it too. So I think there's some really simple things you can start thinking about that help you. This is not a quick process. This takes months, sometimes years, but until you start this process, you're never going to get there. Then let's talk about identity. My favorite exercise with identity is to ask yourself or say the statement, I am, and then fill in the blank. Most people, when they first do this, put in their profession. So I did, I am a physician, which funny is, has very little actually with how I identify today, but it's usually the first thing that comes to mind. But then you start thinking, well, that's what I do for a living, but it's not who I am. So you do it again, I am, and you kind of go further. And then next thing that comes up maybe is your family relations, like I'm a son or I'm a husband or I'm a father. And again, those things define some things and characteristics about you, but it's not totally who you are. After that, maybe achievements, like I'm a Plutus Award winner for the Earn and Invest podcast. Again, things that I'm proud of, but it's not the core of who I am. When I did this, eventually I came up with, I'm a podcaster, a writer, a public speaker. Ultimately, that all coalesced into, I am a communicator. So I think we have to ask ourselves or say that statement, I am over and over again, and be really aspirational. Like not what we are today, but in our best lives, what do we see ourselves as being? So I think those are two great exercises. The visualization about being on your deathbed and then asking yourself or filling that state in that statement, I am, are, are two really great ways to start working I on purpose. I love both of identity. those. I really like the deathbed visualization practice. And that's actually a perfect segue into the next thing I was going to talk about. It's a similar question, but slightly different. I feel like we've actually butted heads on this a bit in the past, Doc G, is living YOLO versus delayed <laughs> gratification. So I've met people on both ends of the spectrum. I've met people in Australia who are scuba instructors. They're making you know, 10 or 12 grand a year, but they're having an absolute blast. They're partying at the hostels every night. They're going out, they're doing scuba lessons in the, the Great Barrier Reef. Like they're just, they're, they're loving it, but they're not saving anything. They're not investing. They don't know what their financial future looks like. I've also met people who are saving 95% of their income who don't go out, they don't hang out with friends, they don't do anything quote unquote fun. And, you know, it's just because they feel this pressure to hit financial independence as quickly as possible. So, you know, again, echoing what Justin said, I love your takes and analogies and just how you think through things. How do you kind of help people, you know, weigh that scale when it comes to YOLO versus delayed gratification with money? And I think this is a great question. And the reason why is we all are going to face this question repeatedly throughout our lives, regardless of who you are, regardless of whether you're interested in financial independence or not, and regardless of the way you get to financial independence, we are all going to struggle with this concept of YOLO, you only live once versus deferred gratification. And the problem is we don't know when we're going to die. Because if I knew I was going to die in 40 years, then I'm all about deferred gratification. On the other hand, if I think I'm going to die next week, I'm all about living for the moment. But we don't know that. So the best proxy I have is what scares us most. Because I think if we start looking at what our fears are, we then can start making rational decisions about how to spend our time and money. There is nothing wrong with YOLO as long as we think about why we're using it and how it fits into our financial plan. So the question is, what scares you most? Are you afraid that you are going to die young and wealthy without ever enjoying that wealth? Or are you afraid that you're going to die old and run out of money and die broke? Depending on which is your biggest fear, you can then start make deci making decisions about how to spend money today. So let me give you some examples. Um, I like to use the example of my father because my father died at the age of 40 and he had a feeling he was going to die young. In fact, he told my mother this when he married her. He said, I don't think I'm going to live real long. For someone who's afraid they're going to die long, young, I think you should do what my father pretty much did. If we think of your income is 100% of your money every year, and 50% of that goes to the essentials, right? Whether that's housing or transportation or food or whatever it is, that 50% is taken up. So then you have 50% left over. For someone who's afraid of dying young and wealthy, I say take 40% of that and put it in a YOLO fund. And then the last 10% goes into deferred gratification and a retirement plan. So let's play that out. What happens if you die young? Well, if you die young, you used your money appropriately to fulfill your sense of purpose, identity, and connections, because that's what we do with money. And you've done it immediately because you had this premonition and you were right. Bingo, you win, kind of, right? You died young, but at least you use your money appropriately. Let's say you're wrong and you live to 80 or 90. Well, 
you're probably going to have to work into your 70s, right? You're not retiring early, but you're also using a lot of your money to enjoy today. You're going on vacations. You're buying that thing that was really meaningful to you. You're doing what you want to do. So you might have a longer career, but you're probably going to enjoy that career quite a bit more because you're using your money to its fullest and you're still using that 10% to defer gratification, to build a path to financial independence. I think everyone should build a path to financial independence, regardless of where you fall on the scale. And that ain't so bad either. So in a sense, you've done fine. Let's look at the other side. You're not worried about dying young. You're worried about living to an old age and dying broke. Well, in that case, you know, grind it out, work really hard, make a lot of money, get it into the stock market or real estate as soon as possible, let it compound. And then maybe you retire at 40 and get all those years to work on purpose, identity and connections. So let's play this out. The worst case scenario is you're wrong. If you grind it out, you front load the sacrifice, you figure you're going to live long and you die at a young age, then you truly will die without enjoying some of your wealth. I guess there are two answers to that. One is you thought you were going to live a long time. So you, you were digging this idea that you were building a path to financial independence, even though you were wrong. The other thing is you're going to leave, I guess, a lot of money to your family. And those are both good things, but that's probably the loser of all scenarios. On the other hand, if you're right, then you save. And so in this case, you save 40% defer gratification with it and use 10% to YOLO. If you're right, that 40% goes into the stock market and real estate, it compounds and you get years and years of freedom and financial independence. So I think if you can answer that question, you can then look at the continuation, the continuum between YOLO and deferred gratification, and you can start deciding where you fall. And that's probably the best way to answer today. Should I spend on that vacation? Should I spend on that new car? Whatever it is, at least now you're intentional and you can set a financial plan up and what I love about this too is you can take your yearly paycheck or your monthly paycheck and have it automatically go into the, either this YOLO fund or this retirement fund and not even have to think about it. So if the money's in your YOLO fund, it's there, you can use it, no stress. And, and so I think I really the idea of like just setting like life YOLO, you only live once is kind of interesting because as you just played it out, there are kind of two ways to think about it. I mean, you, you do only live once. So if you think you're going to live to be 80, wouldn't you really like to have 40 years of, of no pressure and just do whatever you want because you only get to live once? Uh, normally, our brains just go to, well, let's have let's do everything today. But, you know, like you said, you played it out. I think that second scenario where you delay gratification, you've got probably the loser of all scenarios if you die young. But I think you have the winner of all scenarios if you're right. Um, but you also mentioned earlier that you think the financial space is, is kind of matured and thinking about things a little better. Where it's, a, it's a more blend versus this really you know, just shut everything down and, and, and retire as fast as humanly possible. But I, I also think that maybe, and I'm curious what your take is, that maybe we romanticize the idea of not having a job a little too much. Maybe we demonize the idea of working, especially a W-2 job, a little too much. I mean, for me, I love solving problems. I love solving problems. And I get access to problems that there's no way I could get access to on my own and dealing with executives at different corporations and things like that. I'm, you know, I, honestly, probably a little nervous about what kind of void does that leave when that's gone? Like, how do I feel that that problem solving space? And just kind of curious what your takes are, what your take is on people who are retiring early, who maybe haven't took an honest look at what life is going to look like, and maybe they're romanticizing it a little. I think we have to be really intentional about what purpose and identity look like in our life and make appropriate decisions based on that and not whether we're retired or not. I feel like we're going to do work all our lives. So it's more about being intentional about which work you're doing and whether it fulfills you or not. I had a patient, for instance, who is a dishwasher, right? And so he dreamed about the day he'd be able to retire. He eventually had enough money. He did retire. He left work. And what did he do in his free time? He cooked and cleaned and did dishes for himself, except this time, instead of doing it for an employer where he was receiving money, he did it for himself. The difference was when he was at work, he had a community and he had people he saw all the time and he had daily interactions. As he got closer to his deathbed and he did his life review, he realized that actually retiring wasn't good for him and he was more joyful when he was going into the job. We need to start being thoughtful about that stuff now. 
right? You're going to do some kind of work. It drives me crazy that there are people who are so excited about fire that they get their fire number so low that they quit an office job, which is menial and mediocre, to go home and fire their house cleaner and fire their lawn service and spend all their day cleaning their toilets and doing their lawn, which they hate. It's like, well, you might as well be in an office doing something that's you know, you don't love, but at least you're making some money and then can pay someone else to do the things you hate. Um, we've got to get rid of this retire versus not retire, work versus not work. Again, it all comes down to we have these certain number of time slots. What are the decisions we can make to have the most meaningful use of those time slots? Sometimes that means continuing work, like my friend who's a dishwasher who had meaningful interactions with people. Sometimes that means retiring early or going part-time so you can pursue another passion that you already know you have. Sometimes it means slowly getting rid of those things that you don't like at work, even if you're already financially independent, and finding things to fill that time that are exciting and interesting to you. That could take months or years. It took me years to step away from being a physician full-time to figure out what I actually wanted to put in those time slots. So I don't think we have to jump immediately into any of these things. We have to start thinking about the best use of our time. And I think if we do that, we can let go of the traditional uh, definitions of work and employment and start thinking about more what's gratifying to us. I what do we 100% like agree. I think it's so much more fluid now than it was even 20 years ago. Like maybe not 20 years ago, but 50 years ago, working meant you were, I mean, you're not like a factory. It wasn't like you're, you know, working 10 hours a week on your computer, doing things you love. Like there's just... The spectrum has been pulled out so much further, and it's not just like this kind of black and white, like, like you're talking about, Doc. It's, there's a lot more gray area in there. I do want to take the chance to dive into some of the more tactical stuff that you talk about in the book you just released, Taking Stock, and congrats on the launch so far. I know we're recording this a little bit after its launch. It sounds like it's been going well from what we're talking about before we hit record. I want to talk about the three basic archetypes of building wealth. And if you could flesh that out for our audience, I thought it was really helpful the way you did that in the book. So in the book, I talk about the parable of the three brothers, and they're kind of three architects, archetypes that can help guide us when we're being thoughtful about how to use our purpose, identity, and connections to build a financial plan. The parable of the three brothers basically describes this idea that there are three brothers. The eldest brother is kind of like the front loader, wants to grind it out, rushes through their path to get to the end so that they can enjoy a long period of freedom. A lot like kind of the traditional fire practitioner, someone like a Mr. Money Mustache or a J.D. Roth. The middle brothers are a lot like your generation, people who are into passive income, people who are into side hustles. They actually can get to financial independence faster because as opposed to looking at some net worth number as their way to financial independence, they actually look at creating enough side hustle or passive income money to fulfill their monthly needs. They may reach financial independence faster, but their careers may be longer, especially if they're not saving and putting money into the, into the stock market or into real estate. These brothers might still work. It might be passive income, so it might not take as much maintenance, but they may work actually longer than the eldest brothers. And finally, the youngest brothers we talked about a little bit already are the passion play. People who find something they're passionate about, something they would do even if they weren't going to make money. But in this case, they happen to make money and they make enough money to support themselves. So of course, they're going to need disability insurance. They're going to need life insurance and all those basic things. But in a sense, they're financially independent immediately, but they will be working a very long career, especially if they're not saving, because they're going to need to continue doing that work in order to pay their way through their life. But again, if that work has a lot of purpose, identity, and connections in it, then that's kind of the meaning of financial independence. That's what we're going for. I love these archetypes because they give us a way forward to start building purpose and identity into our lives the truth, of course, is much more messy. A lot of times we borrow from different brothers' paths at different times. I'm a perfect example of that. When my father died and he was a physician, I wanted to be a physician like him. I was very much the youngest brother. I was going after the passion play. But then I got tired of medicine and burned out, and I decided I needed to grind it out to make as much money as possible so that I could retire early. So I became an eldest brother. But in a sense, then I also started doing side hustles, passive income to increase my net worth and took from the path of the middle brother. 
So I'm not saying we have to stick to one of these paths versus another, but I think these paths help us be intentional about how we spend our time and which way to financial independence fits us best and still allows us to be We've talked a lot about and different build ways to get to life. financial independence and the pros and cons. But regardless of which way you go, there's going to be a lot of, of effort involved, a lot of work involved. Sometimes it's a long time because you're doing something maybe you're really passionate about but doesn't pay well. Maybe it, or it could be just a really hard grind because you're trying to save as much money as possible. But either way, like you have a very vested interest in what you have built. And I say all that to say, like, you know, for people who finally reach that point, I guess, do you have any recommendations or just thoughts on how do you then enjoy it and not treat it like this thing that you have to protect above all costs? And you kind of turn into Gollum holding your holding your ring. Yeah. And again, I think we have to recognize that money or even our jobs or the businesses we build are tools. And a lot of times we use these tools to pursue our purpose, identity, and connections. And so you have to be aware of that. When we become so obsessed with the tool that we can't actually use it to do what we want in life, the tool becomes meaningless. It becomes a false goal, right? And so the idea is if you love your business and that gives you meaning, then of course, spend your time worrying about your business. But on some level, if the point of your business is to make you money so that you can live a life of purpose, obsessing over your business is just gonna keep you from doing the things you wanna do in life. And so we really have to transition away from this idea that some net worth or some amount of passive income is the ultimate answer to our questions. I think we have to start looking at what we really want out of life and then recognize these things as tools to get there. And so tools are interchangeable. We use one as it serves us. And if one doesn't work, we use another. And what's more enduring are those things that really give us a sense like we're doing what we should be in life. I like to call that the climb. It's these things that we're busy doing that give us a sense of joy in the process of doing, but also we have some goals and we can make some incremental gain. It's building as many of those climbs into our life as possible. So we enjoy what we're doing regardless of the outcome. All these other things are just supportive tools to spend our time doing those. So things, talking about climbs. spending time, it sounds like you might need some type of a budget or at least some way to think about how you spend your time. And I think I personally struggle with this. It's like, okay, I could be doing this and like building this business and making more money. Like, do I have enough money yet? Like I want to be even more financially independent versus like I could spend an hour, you know, talking with a family member on the phone or hanging out with a friend or getting dinner on a Tuesday night. And I'm always constantly battling in my head. And I feel like a lot of people in the financial independent space are probably in similar situations. It's like, should I focus on the money, the business, whatever? Should I focus on spending time with loved ones? And I'm just hoping that you have a framework and, you know, I'm going to use this personally to help people who <laughs> struggle with something like that. Like, how do you actually you know, budget your time in a way that's not going to be detrimental to you later down the road? Like, you don't want to be spending all your time doing something that's completely nonproductive. This is like the, you know, the youngest brother, but he doesn't make any money. You don't want to be that guy. But you also don't want to be someone who's just like spending all their time on money related things. And then you miss out on the connection and purpose and things like that. I love the words we use regarding <laughs> time. We say spending time or budgeting time. It all makes it sound like we can commoditize time and we can't. We can't trade time for money. Time is persistent, consistent, and unchangeable. Time passes no matter what you do. So I really prefer to look at it more like there are these time slots that fill up our lives, whether those are days, months, or years. And the only thing we really have control over is what activities we put in those time slots because time is gonna pass no matter what you do. So the real question is, how do you fill as many of those time slots as possible doing things that give you a sense of meaning and purpose? That's our goal. So in the beginning, sometimes we fill those time slots with things that maybe don't fulfill our sense of meaning and purpose, but do make us money, which is a tool which eventually we can use to free up these time slots so that we can do more meaningful things during them. But ultimately, what you should do is be intentional about this idea that you have a set amount of time and then start looking at the trade-offs. 
one of those trade-offs is, am I going to spend this time slot, let's say it's a day or a week or even an hour working on my business, or am I going to spend it hanging out with family, which has a lot of meaning for me? And a lot of that depends on how much leverage spending that time slot working on your business is going to give you. If spending that hour working on your business is going to create a perpetual money machine that eventually makes you financially independent and gives you countless time slots available, then maybe putting in that hour is good. On the other hand, if you're going to grind away for an hour and probably get very little done, then maybe that time is better spent with your family and friends. It's never perfect. And of course, we're going to mess it up. Sometimes we're going to miss that time slot when we should have been doing work. Sometimes we're going to do something really meaningful during it. We just don't know. But the idea is how can we best align those time periods? And I wish there was a better answer. Um, we probably spend more time doing things we don't want to do than we should. I guess I'll give you that caveat. Um, and so we should keep that in mind and be real intentional about streamlining those things we don't like doing and working immediately on ways to subtract those out and add in things we do like doing. Maybe those things we do like doing provide revenue, so they take the place of those other revenue-generating things we're doing that we don't like. But I wish I could give you a clear formula, but it's all about being intentional. So if you're thinking about- A lot things, of our discussion has been trade-offs. A lot of times we've been talking about kind of a financial choice versus an enjoyment choice. But I think even within financial decisions, there's kind of some trade-offs to be made. And I'm thinking back to a time where actually it was a coworker's father wanted to talk to me because they knew I was really into personal finance. And we're curious, like, hey, should I pay my house off? Which is always like a, a funny debate, like on Twitter and whatever. And I was like, okay, well, how much do you owe on the house? And it's like, let's say it's $200,000. Uh, what's your interest rate? Two and a half percent. Okay. And I said, well, would you, if somebody came up to you and said, I've got this awesome investment guaranteed two and a half percent return, all I need is $200,000. Would you invest in it? He's like, well, no. And I was like, well, that's what you just asked me, you know, but what I can't quantify is how much peace it gives him to say, <laughs> I don't have a mortgage anymore. That's one thing off my plate. I don't know no matter what happens, like this house is paid off. So I'm kind of curious, you know, when you're thinking about that, I'm not sure if that come up on the book, but like, you know, what, do, how do you kind of think about questions like that? I love these kind of questions. And part of the reason is we are always so A or B on these things we're very black and white on them. But the truth of the matter is either or like, yes, pay off your mortgage. Yes. Put the money in the stock market. You don't have to be perfect to do really well with finances. I'd say the fact that you're being intentional with your money and either way, you're going to get some return on your money is better than getting no return on your money and puts you ahead of the game. So we really love to think that if we just do everything perfect, it's going to get us to some type of nirvana. But the reality is it's much easier to be 80% of the way there and to accept imperfection and still know you're doing good. And so I think we have to give people permission to do either or and not worry specifically about that extra one or 2%. I know we love incremental gain and we love, you know, adding those one or 2% until we get 10 or 20%. That's only as good as you gamify it and feel good about it. When it starts causing stress in your life and you're choosing between two good options, go with whichever makes you feel better Like and let it be. Like you're already ahead of the game. We do this all the time. You know, the arguments of, you know, Roth IRA versus 401k, you know, should we convert our you know, should we do a backdoor Roth or shouldn't we do a backdoor Roth? All of that's great, but it's pretty much twiddling our thumbs for personal finance experts. Your average Joe or Jane out there doesn't need to be nearly as granular. They need to save. They need to invest reasonably and they need to be conscious about their money. And if they take those first few steps, they're going so to be way ahead of the you. average Joe and Jane. I know that you're trying to, you know, kind of explode your brand, expand your brand and hit a broader audience with your book, Taking Stock. What is, if you can... If you can think of one at the top of your head, what's like one main lesson, maybe something we haven't talked about yet that you really want to get out there? Like while you're writing the book, you're like, 
I'm, I just crushed it with this chapter. Like people are going to get so much value out of this. I feel like so many people don't know about this concept of this tactic. Does anything come to mind? You know, the, the most basic is that money itself doesn't make you happy. And, and I think that I think everybody has to understand that, like and especially people who aren't interested in personal finance at all. It's like money will not make you happy. It will not solve all your problems. It will solve your money problems, which are one of many of the problems we have as human beings. On the other hand, being intentional about your money will give you space and time to solve a lot of problems, money and otherwise. And so it's like one of those things that concentrating it on it only won't get you very far. One question I always love to ask authors, because I can imagine this process that you go through and the, the, the revisions and how much passion you've poured into it is like, after the book was released, what were some of the things you immediately thought, oh man, I wish I could just make that one more edit. I wish I could change that. <laughs> I mean, there are a few grammatical errors here and there, um, but the concepts, I don't have any that I really wish I could change. I mean, I think the concepts make sense and are straightforward and endure. Um, figure out your purpose, identity, and connections. Build a path to financial independence. Be thoughtful about spending now versus spending later. I, I mean, I think these are timeless issues. Well, that's okay, too. And I don't know if I'd go in, and really change well, that's anything awesome. major about those. <laughs> yeah, I feel like most authors have, have at least one thing. They're like, I wish I added that, you know, one more story to that chapter, just flesh out that concept a little bit more. But I, I think just, I mean, everything you've talked about and covered in the book is, like you said, it's it's something that doesn't get talked about enough. I don't think people value their time. And I know I even kind of tongue in cheek use the phrase budgeting time, but time runs no matter no matter what. It's not like money where you can just keep getting more of it. Maybe you can, you know, you can't really scale your time like you can with money. Like you can't have your time earn you time. That would be a really cool universe to live in. But unfortunately, it's not the one we live in. I actually saw just a couple of days ago, it was like, I forget who was speaking, but it was at a financial conference and they were like, you know, Warren Buffett has, I don't even know how much money he has now, however many hundreds of billions of dollars, who in this room would trade places with him? And of course, no one raises their hand because no one wants to be 92 years old. But uh, no one no one really thinks about that. No one thinks about yeah, how much yeah. they value their time. But when you put it like that, you're like, would you take, you know, $300 billion, but you're going to be 93 versus you're 25 right now with nothing to your name. People are going to be 25 with nothing to their name 100 times out of 100. It's just, it's simple. Yeah. And... And I'd argue that of 122 year olds, a billion dollars would probably solve maybe one or two of their problems. And the other 98 would still have a lot of life problems. I mean, it's just human nature. Money solves money problems. And that is not the sum total of what gets us as human beings. We're complex individuals. We need more than money. We need purpose. We need a sense of identity. We need to connect with the people around us and money won't get you there. It'll help. Well, Doc G, I really ways, appreciate you coming on the show. And if you ever decide to do like a Spotify kind of session where you like guide someone and calm them down and, you know, maybe ease them to sleep, uh, I would love to like just listen to, to you because every time we talk, I always feel better about myself. I always feel a little less stress and I'm always like, you know what? Maybe you are doing good. Maybe you're doing okay. Maybe you're doing good enough. So I appreciate you coming on the show. I hope the listeners get that same feeling. I love your insights. Uh, so just again, Appreciate it. Where do you want listeners to go to find the book, to learn more about you, to just, you know, get more of your philosophies? So the best place to go to find out all about the book, as well as my platforms, is jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. There you can go find everything about the book and how to buy it as well as I have links to the three places that I pretty much produce content. I have a medical blog, which I did from about 2005 to 2018. It's linked there. I have a personal finance blog. Diversify is linked there, as well as the Earn and Invest podcast. The shortcut is to go right to earnandinvest.com if you just want to listen to the podcast, but you'll see links to the book. Awesome. Well, and we will definitely link too. up all of the things you just mentioned in our show notes so our listeners can just click over, listen to the podcast, get the book, all that good stuff. Doc G, always a pleasure. I'm sorry, I just can't get myself to call you Jordan. We'll definitely uh, call you Jordan in the intro, give you the proper <laughs> author title because you were anonymous when we first met. But man, it has been a wild journey just in friendship and mentorship. And like Justin said, it's always it's always calming to just hear you kind of flesh out ideas and philosophy. So 
thank you for spending some time with us today because you know like we just said time is finite yeah thank you for having me and i just want to make sure that everyone understands some of that <laughs> mentorship was you guys mentoring me so that i got a much better understanding of living for today a little more oh, man. So.